Hey guys, Jake Carlson here, host of the Modern Leadership Podcast. Are you ready to focus on amplifying your leadership superpowers? Let's go. Good morning, my friends and fellow elite achievers. Welcome to Modern Leadership, the podcast where each week we sit down with authors, entrepreneurs, and leaders to explore their journey, diving into the ups, their downs, and ultimately the lessons they learned along the way. Our goal? To show that everything is figure outable. And today's guest is Mo Carrick. Mo is a best selling author and founder of Momentum Inc., helping brave people do the hard things that make organizations great. She holds a master's degree in organizational development and is a certified daring way, dare to lead facilitator. Her newest book, Brave Space Workplace Making Your Company Fit for Human Life, is on shelves now. Mo, it is great to have you with us. Welcome to Modern Leadership. Thank you so much. I'm super happy to be here, Jake. You know, I often on this podcast talk about Big Mo, and it's a, it's a terminology that came from the compound effect by Darren Hardy, talks about big momentum, and you've got this company, Momentum, and I love it. I'm excited to jump into it, uh, but before we do, tell us a little bit about you. What did we miss by way of intro? Well, it was a pretty nice intro. I always listen to intros, and I think, wow, that person sounds you know interesting, but I'm not sure, you know, what what fully you miss. Obviously, there's more to me though than what I'm working on right now. As there is all of us, right? We tend to think about, oh, we've, you know, we've got our work, and that's what the intro usually covers. I would say some of the other things about me are I'm a I'm a mom. My kids are almost grown. My uh, youngest is 17, and I'm an avid gardener. And I just this weekend I'm super excited because we got bees. <laughs> bees. Yes. It's going to lead into tons of flowers and all that, right? It's the first step. It's the first step. And and it's also, you know, very good for the environment because the bees have kind of been in crisis these last few years. And, and eventually we may even get some honey. But it's sort of a new hobby that my husband and I are getting into. It's kind of intimidating. You have to suit up and everything. But, you know, to me, bees are like the ultimate example of, of a system that works. And as a systems thinker in the realm of organizations, I'm really kind of infatuated with the way that the bees figure it all out. Everybody has a role and, and they sort to it. So that's a, that's a fun little, little fact about me right now. And they kind of seem to go about it without any complaint, huh? Yeah, they, they do. I mean, it was really amazing because we, you buy the bees in a three pound box. We bought two that they're in a little box and they, they each have a queen who's in her own little sub box. And then when you put them in the hive, you literally open up one end of the box and you just drop them down in there like with a big jolt, you know, and most of them just sort of fall down into the hive. And as soon as they're in there, they just get busy like, OK, well, I guess this is our new home. So, you know, let's start <laughs> let's start getting it ready. And they're very busy. We haven't, we can't check on them for three days. So tomorrow we'll take a peek in. But by all, by all counts, they seem, they seem very, um, very busy. Well, and, and the reason I kind of smile and chuckle about this, your new book, Brave Space Workplace, How to Make Your Company Fit for Human Life. And we look at this and we say, you know, it would be so much easier if we could run our businesses without the human drama element. And yet we have to, we must. And so I want to jump into this book a little bit, but take us to kind of the writing of it. What, how'd you come up with the idea and what was your goal as you wrote this book? Yeah, a great question. You know, it's interesting because this is my second book that I've written. The first came out in 2017, Fit Matters, How to Love Your Job. I wrote that book with a co-author, Cami Dunaway. And I would say that book was a really different writing experience than this one. This book was a book I had in mind to write all the way along. I felt like I needed to write the first book first with Cami. It was a wonderful partnership. And we were really trying to offer something for job seekers to find out what's the best place to bring out their best skills and create a meaningful life. But the book that was really in my heart and spirit from the beginning, I think really was Brave Space Workplace. As a consultant to organizations now for many years, almost, you know, coming up on 30, actually, which is embarrassing to say sometimes, but it also feels like, wow, I have some wisdom here. Yeah, you're the person we want to bring in. You've seen it all. That's right. Well, you know, it's interesting because I never thought that I would really be in this work. But I got my graduate degree in organizational development in 1989. And, you know, we knew then what we know now about what it takes for human beings to thrive. And I find myself in recent years kind of getting tired about like, well, then why aren't we doing it? You know, like, 
what's the problem? And we have endless theories and tons of books and consultants like me that are out there trying to define and, and help organizations figure out how to get that combination of science and magic, you know, right to activate the best their people have to offer. But it's, it's no easy trick, you know. So I think where I came to writing the book was trying to find a way to consolidate what I know and what I've seen in a easy to read format for leaders at any level to be able to pick up and say, oh, like, here's where it can start. Here's the really important things that matter. And the process of writing the book per your question was really different than the first time because I sort of wrote this one in a down and dirty fashion. Cam and I took about a year to co-author the first book. And and this one I cranked out um, really, I would say, in about three months. Oh, my goodness dedicated work. Yeah, but you know, really culminating a a career's worth of experiences. So that was pretty fun because I felt like I had access to the stories and the experience from my decades of working with clients. And so it wasn't, it didn't feel that hard in many ways to, to get it all down on paper. One of the things that I think about when it comes to like books, there's so many business books, there's so many personal development, there's so many leadership books out there. What differentiates them is the ability of the author to tell stories, to draw on personal experience or experiences that they've seen throughout their career. And when you look back and say, what I add to this leadership, business, workplace development space is the fact that you've seen so many different experiences and stories and so many different things throughout your career that you bring those all into the story and share it in a way that's not just the theoretical which we've got plenty of theoretical books out there, but really bring it into the practical, how this makes sense in my company and moving forward. And one of the things that's been on my mind as you were talking about that, I do a lot of coaching. And one of the things that I find is that most of the time, the challenges that the people that I'm coaching, the people that I'm working with, most of the time, their problems, their challenges are very similar. And there's simple solutions to them, but they want to make them so much more complex. And as an right. author, I imagine 30 years experience, you probably saw that as well. You're, you're writing down what these leaders need to do in the workplace and you're finding, well, they're pretty simple, but I want to make it in a way that makes this book valuable and makes it worthwhile. So tell me a little bit about that process. Well, you know, it's interesting because I do feel like I have a lot of stories at my avail, having consulted to so many organizations. And I also think that above all else, you know, what most of us need when we're reading a business book is hope, you know, like hope for the problems we're facing, belief that, you know, we've got this and that there's a way through what's really the messy, you know, hairy stuff. I mean, writing a business plan, designing a product, as hard as those tasks are, they're not as hard as figuring out how to deal with the messy, imperfect beings that work for us, which are the people, the greatest asset of any company and also the highest risk. Because if we're not capable of activating our people fully, we either end up with employees who are underemployed and therefore very expensive or employees who just for one reason or another aren't bringing the best they can to our company, which limits us in a lot of ways. So I think what I look for when I'm reading a business book, and you're right, it's a really cluttered space. I mean, there's there's just more and more every day that, that are um, produced. But I know when I pick one up, I want to be able to see myself in that story. I want to be able to read and go, oh, wow, that person, you know, cracked that code or tried that thing and it had a good outcome. And maybe I can try that, you know, and what, what will it take for me to apply that in my own lives? And, you know, you mentioned the storytelling Jake, it's one of the things that Brene Brown does so well. One of the reasons I'm a big fan and, of course, have chosen to to use her approach is she's a beautiful storyteller and she's able to really apply her own models to her own life. And when she tells us those stories in her writing, we kind of go, oh, yeah. Yeah. And I love that because and we're big Brene Brown fans as well that are, you know, we look at the opportunity, the stories, we connect with them and so on and so forth. I want to crack open this book. And I want to take a look at what Brave Space Workplace is teaching us. Let's dive into just a couple of the teachings that gets us excited to go and pick up a copy. So one of your big things is maximizing potential. And so let's start with that. How we do it. Yeah. Let's talk about maximizing potential because, you know, the truth of the matter is we're surrounded by imperfect human beings that are out there trying to do the best that they can do. And the truth of the matter is they add color, variety, and opportunity to our lives. They make it interesting. And so there's a lot of advantages to having these 
imperfect people around us. But what we want to do, you talk about having people on your team that are either very highly paid and underutilized or the opposite, which is, you know, they're underpaid, underutilized, you know, they're wasting, wasting space within our organization. How do we maximize the potential within our organization of the people that we have on our team and particularly within ourselves or within them if we're leaders of followers? Great question. And, and I, I, you know, there's not, of course, any one right answer, but there were two, you know, two things that I really tried to go after in the Braves Facebook and that have really resonated as real for me, both in my own firm and also in the firms that I consult with in the organizations I consult with, that I would put them in two big buckets. One is, what is it that people really need from work? And the other is, what are the elements of what I have to deliver in my organization in order to activate the best that those people have? And so when you talk about potential, you know, to me, these are a couple different aspects of potential, right? So one is, do I have the ability to contribute in a way that I can connect the dots to that really matters to someone? We have a basic human need to be part of things that are bigger than ourselves. You know, Maslow named it on his hierarchy of needs, right? We want to be part of something. And so a lot of potential and activation, I think, is for leaders to be able to deliver the context for any employee to say, oh, yeah, like what I'm doing really matters. And one of my favorite stories about that in my own life was years ago, I was a college student. I took a job in the summer to be near my boyfriend. Good reason to take a student a job in a strange town, right? That's right. And, <laughs> and I was I was a janitor. I was a janitor in a large healthcare system. I rode my bike to work every day. I got there at seven. I worked till three. And um, it was a pretty busy job. You know, taught me how to clean the rooms. And we did. And then I was like three weeks in the job. And my boss, whose name was Pedro, I'll, I'll always remember him, he asked me to meet with him. And I had had a patient on my floor who died. And she had come in for gallbladder surgery. And I knew her because sometimes when I was cleaning the room, we would chit chat when before she was going into surgery and when she first was in, in her recovery. And he informed me that she had died. And, that, and he asked if I knew how she had died. And I said, I didn't. You know, I assumed it was a complication from surgery. And he said, well, she died because she got an infection here at the hospital. And it's probably because we or someone in another role like us in the hospital didn't really adequately sanitize the room. And so he wanted to review with me the order in which I used the different substances that we cleaned with and how I was following the protocol. And that was a really powerful moment for me because I, all of a sudden, this sort of humdrum job that I was being paid minimum wage for that was just to keep me in a town near my boyfriend became like, whoa, like what I do could actually make a difference to whether someone's mother or sister or daughter or wife comes home from the hospital for a routine surgery. And, you know, to me, that's how we begin to activate potential, isn't it? Right. Where we go, oh, I what I'm doing here makes a difference. Like I can't just slap my way through this job because there's bigger things at stake. And I remember that moment really clearly all these many years later. And so I, I think that's a big piece of potential is hooking someone with how what they're doing matters, whether we're in the C-suite or we're at the front line. Does, does that ring true for you? Yeah, it absolutely rings true. And this is a powerful story. And I want to ask you, because I think this says a lot about you as well. Of course, it says a lot about your boss or your manager that sat you down and had this conversation, but it also says a lot about you. And I want to ask you how this experience, how you walk the line between being overcome with maybe some guilt, some embarrassment that potentially it was, you know, he, he's not pointing the finger saying, Mo, this was your fault. He was saying, right. you know, this is important that we look at this. But there are people out there that would take this internally and say, did I make a mistake? And this could potentially reduce their ability to take risks or to be involved because of fear, because of guilt, whatever it may be. And so I want to ask you, because I think it says a lot about how you accepted the the challenge and also the feedback as a follower of this one leader. It's a great question. And of course, you know, there's some details of that that are a little foggy for me because it was a long time ago. But one thing I remember is that I don't feel like he shamed me. He didn't know, nor did I, whether I was in fact the one that caused this terrible thing to happen, but he knew that that it was important that we bring some rigor, you know, to the cleaning. But I don't remember feeling blamed. I remember feeling responsible. 
And I also remember feeling safe to ask him questions because the truth, Jake, was, you know, I had been oriented for like 20 minutes, you know, like I didn't, it wasn't a comprehensive, you know, training to teach me how to how to do this. And so I remember thinking, well, I better maybe be more curious about this and and make sure that I'm understanding it. And one of the things, you know, when I, in Brave Space, I named these seven things that people need from work. And one of them I just mentioned, which is the need to contribute. Another one is the ability to feel supported, which I define as being able to be brave, knowing that there are risks. And I think that's what I felt with Pedro on that day was like, I was it was okay for me to ask questions. I needed to be brave and put my voice out there around the things I didn't understand. And there wasn't a hundred percent guarantee that I was going to do my job perfectly. He couldn't promise me that this wouldn't happen again, but I was supported enough to be a curious, open learner about this, you know, pretty basic, but important job. So I, I think that's a really important part of how leaders create the opportunities with their workforce for all the great things that come from when we feel supported, brave, even when there's risks like innovation and creativity and out of the box thinking and diverse new partnerships and creative customer relationships. All those things come from being able to really be brave beyond the safe confines. And I think that's what I felt in that moment with him was like, okay, I've got to ask some hard questions, make sure I understand this. But I think what he did really powerfully was he, he offered feedback to me without blaming and shaming me. Yeah, which would have shut you down and not as an organization grown. And I think there's some great leadership lessons that our leaders listening can take out of this. And one of them is you mentioned how he sat you down and had you walk him through the process that you took, the order of the cleaners that you used and what you did, which says to me, there was a process, a procedure, there was a system that was going on within that business. And as leaders, it's important for us to identify what those processes are, what those systems are within our organization, and help to train our people to follow the system. And clearly within the system, they have the opportunity for growth, they have the opportunity for creativity and innovation and all that. But we want to set the groundwork, the framework for them to be able to do the job and know the process that they need to go through. And that gives us the opportunity to measure what they're doing as leaders to know that they're following the key performance indicators or the OKRs, the objectives and key results that we talk about that are so vitally important as a leader, making sure that your team is living up to their potential and going down that path. So talk to me a little bit about processes, systems, procedures within this Brave Space framework. Really another great question because it is the combination of things that, that activate us. We need we need boundaries and we need rules, we need protocol. And that was, you know, part of what I was asking for my of my boss in that scenario. So I mentioned the two out of the seven things that people need from work. And when I move from the book beyond those seven things, we haven't covered all of them, but we've hit a couple big ones. The way that I articulate in Brave Space the technique for actually creating a brave space workplace, which I really define as a place where people can bring their full selves, even when they're imperfect and do great things together. I call them levers, you know, just like any kind of tool that's a lever where you can, when you do these five things, you can get more traction in your business success or in your organizational success. And one of those levers, lever three, I call the where or the when, And I define it as purposeful design. And that's really what you're speaking to, I think, here, Jake. You know, to me, design can include anything. It can include the space in which we work. It can include the hierarchy of our organizational structure. It can include our performance management conversations and the rules and technology that support those. It can include our team dynamics, whether we're remote or in person and how, what's our protocol? How often do we meet? How do we treat each other? All of those things have a design element and they matter tremendously in terms of activating our best. And the thing that's interesting to me about purposeful design is that unfortunately, and I think this is one of the things that does drive leaders at a reorganization kind of crazy is not any one design works beautifully for any one person, Yeah, whether a protocol or a physical space. I have a number of clients, as an example, who have tried to create people-centered workplaces by having their offices be open. And it's a design move. It's like saying, oh, we're going to have more collaboration if everybody's out in the same space, you know, including the CEO. And what they're finding now is that there's some pieces of that that work really well. 
But for some of the employees, it works terribly, like the extroverts, because they want to talk all the time. Yeah. And and when they do, they get feedback from the introverts, like, um, I'm here with my headphones and this isn't really working because you're just always talking to me, you know, over the cubicle. That's right. And so we have to be really open and flexible to a variety of design techniques, whether it's processes or systems or structure or physical space to meet the unique needs of our people. Well, and I want to dive into that just a little bit deeper, because earlier you talked about that, you know, over a 30 year career, you found that there's some things that have stayed the same, some things that you knew back then, what we know now and, and applied them even back in the 80s when you were going through your graduate program. But there are so many other things within leadership, within business that are changing all the time. How do we balance that? These are tried and true. These are standard foundational principles that are going to be around and be this way forever versus all the innovation and changes and the the open-minded and the open workspace and all of that. How do you balance the two? Gosh, if I had a magic bullet on that one, I probably would have written that book, you know? Right. I think one way we do is we ground ourselves in what doesn't change. And I think what doesn't change is what people need. You know, what people need has been pretty consistent in all these many years I've been in business and in in really, you know, since time immemorial. We as human beings need the same thing. You know, we need to connect with other people. We need to feel supported to take risks. We need to be able to make our lives work. We need to have the ability to pay our bills. And so I think that's an anchor in many ways around, okay, human needs, human motivation, whether we're in a small rural community or we're in a large urban environment with a mega company, we know that the human beings that work there are going to tend to have consistent needs from work. So I think that's one thing. And then the other piece of that coin, the other sort of paradox, right, of what you're asking is this ability to recognize that really, like you said, Jake, everything does change. Yeah. One of the biggest areas that I did some new research on for Brave Space was in the realm of technology. I think I titled the chapter Machines, AI, and Robots, Oh My, because <laughs> we're seeing this tremendous fear, burgeoning fear in the workforce around the role technology is going to play. Is it going to eliminate all jobs for human beings? And and then there's this tremendous presence, both enabling wonderful things with technology and also creating some things that we're not even sure we understand the tail end of. But the way I see it, it's like we don't really have a choice except to lean towards that, lean into it and examine it and make conscious, thoughtful decisions about, all right, the pace of technology is not likely going to slow down. Yeah. What about that? Are we going to utilize to help our organizations be um, even better and combine that with the things that we know that only humans can do and elevate the partnership really between human beings and machines. So this is one example of many, but I, I think it's, I think it requires a tolerance for ambiguity against this change, these changes we face, you know, combined with maybe that surety of like, okay, people are people. Yeah. And I think you're absolutely right. I love that you talk about this in the chapter, because when you look at it, there's really nothing that we can do. We as individuals to stop the pace of technology, it's here, it's changing. We're going to have to deal and adapt with it, adjust to it. And we can't just bury our heads in the sand and ignore it. The same thing with millennials in the workplace. I mean, for years, for the last 10 years, we've had sessions and seminars, webinars, and all sorts of trainings on how to hire and cultivate and put into action millennials in the workforce. The truth and reality of the matter is they are here. They're part of our workforce, and we need to not lower our standards, but we need to adjust somewhat what we expect in the workplace, not from them, but how we relate and interact with them, much like we do with technology. Now, you mentioned something. The first thing you mentioned, I want to go back and ask you a question about that. And that is people need this connection. People need this working with other people. How do we do this in a remote company? Because more and more people are working remotely. They're having offsite opportunities. I know that my company is fully remote. Everybody works from home. We're all in different states. So how do we keep this connection in a remote society? Yes, that's so big, I think, for for all of us right now. And, you know, I'm not really sure. I mean, I think we're I think we're getting better at it. And I think technology will help. But the research I'm seeing and my lived experience with clients is that 
as good as Skype and Zoom and, you know, video conferencing and everything are, when we're working remotely, we still are limited in one key way. And that is that we do not know yet how to communicate the limbic brain response, which is the pheromonally based response of emotion across the digital <laughs> landscape. Yeah, you know? yeah. We come pretty close. Like even right now, you and I are talking and we're kind of like getting each other. Like we're yeah. feeling each other. We got, you know, we can tell a bit, but we don't have, it would be really different if we were in person because we'd also have not only eye contact and visual cues, but we'd also have that limbic brain response of, you know, how we feel each other, how we feel the emotion of each other. And so, you know, one of my hobbies or the things I do as a volunteer is that I'm a TED organizer for our local TED event. And as a result, I've had the good fortune of attending a lot of TED events. And I heard a speaker at, at Big TED um, a while back who was on the uh, autism spectrum. And she was a PhD level researcher and she was speaking about that they're developing computers that are actually going to, to learn how to read emotional response through pheromone sensors. And it's, it's the particular application is for people on the spectrum because they have trouble sometimes reading social cues accurately. Right. That's part the disorder. And I just was so fascinated about that. I thought, oh my gosh, we could use that for remote workers because people could maybe feel each other more, more deeply. Um, and so I do think that will come. And then I think in the meantime, we need to really find ways to come as close as we can virtually and then to occasionally connect in an in-person way because it is a basic human need and we bring it to everything that we do. And, you know, without human connection, we as social beings actually fail to thrive and we will ultimately die. And hopefully, you know, in, in a society that's really healthy beyond the organization, it's not only at work that we have connection. You know, we have connection in our communities and in our families and in our home. And so I think that's one of the roles for organizations is to make sure that they're supporting the development of those healthy communities so feel people feel that connection also happens at home. But let's face it, anyone working full-time in an organization right now is spending more time at work and with the people that they work with than they are at home. Yeah, and that's clear. So that means, you know, to me, that puts some pressure on us to keep our foot on the gas a bit around making sure that we have that, those authentic, transparent, emotionally centered, courageous connections with one another where we do feel each other. And we can come pretty close remotely, but I think every now and then we need to try to get in the same room. Well, and I think this is a great response. I want you to know that my company gets together four times a year in person. We usually spend about seven days a quarter not training, learning together, having fun, going out to dinner, making sure that we can connect not just on a professional level, but on a personal level, because we do spend so much time, you know, on the phone or so much time across the computer that it's important to really see each other, feel those emotions. You talk about emotions. I talk about energy. There's energy in the room. You can feel it. It's so vitally important. And I thank you for going down that path. Now, Mo, we could talk about this all day. For a long time, but alas, our podcast is running towards the end and we need to shift gears. Talk a little bit about learning from leaders. Are you ready to dive into our next section? Sure. Okay. Our first question now is the book currently on your Kindle or bedside table. What are you reading? Well, I read a lot of books at the same time and I checked today because I knew I was talking to you. So I'm reading a couple. One is I just picked up and it's, I'm going to finish it tonight because it's an easy read. Abby Wambach's Wolfpack which is awesome. Abby's partner, Glennon Doyle, is an endorser on my book. I love them both. I follow them. And I'm loving what she's saying about um, the community of women. Uh -huh. So so that's one. I have also on my stand right now is an, a book I haven't cracked open very far yet, but it's by Aaron Digman. It's called Brave New Work. Aaron is in the same space as you and I are. And he's taking kind of an interesting view that's really aligned, I think, with some of the things I'm looking at. So I'm curious about what he's saying. And then the latest fun one that I noticed when I glanced at my shelf, I was actually reading it last night, is a book I just picked up by Joshua Mesrich called When Death Becomes Life. And it's about a transplant surgeon. And I'm just super interested in that and how we transplant organs. And then last but not least, I love to read fiction. Well, I, was, I knew this was coming. I was waiting for it. Let's hear some fiction. 
love I love to read fiction. I actually just ordered. It's not on my bedstand yet, but I just ordered City of Girls by Liz Gilbert, and um, I love her work, and so I'm excited to get that. But I'm also reading a Elizabeth George novels. You know, she's a mystery writer who writes about mysteries in the in the UK, and I just love reading her sometimes to sort of uh, mellow. So I got a bunch of books going on right now. I love to read. You know, it's funny as we have these, I do an interview every week. I'm talking to different leaders and entrepreneurs every single week. And when I talk to women, I get four or five books. There's always a bunch going on. When I talk to men, oftentimes I'll just get one book. And so I think it's kind of interesting. All great suggestions. I happen to be a big fictional reader myself. I can't go to bed at night without busting. I try Mm -hmm. to read about 15, 30 minutes and it ends up being usually an hour to an hour and 15 and I'm way too tired the next day. But I love fictional books. So thank you for those shares. What's your best fiction right now? You know, so I'm really big into the kind of the assassin government spy types of books. So Anything Jack Reacher. So Lee Child, I love them all. He's like my favorite. I've read every single one of them. I think there's 22, 23 of them. Oh, he's a great character. Once I finished all those, which I I have now, I'm just waiting for the new one comes out every November. So I'm I'm just waiting, counting them down. But I've started getting into, what's, what's his name? He has a bunch of different spy series and each series is a different character. What is his name? Ah... Well, I have to think about it. It's going to pop to me when we ask the next question, and then I'll tell you. Um, awesome. But, uh, but I'll let you know. Uh, our next question, what is your leadership superpower? My leadership superpower, I did your little test because I was very curious. I had my own in mind, and I, but I was like, well, instead of just saying that, I'm going to see what his assessment does. And they were the same. Very cool. Yeah, adaptability. Well, and we're kindred spirits. Because that's mine as well. And I really love that one. But before I tell you my reason, why don't you tell me about that and how you came to that conclusion, even before taking the leadership assessment? Well, you know, I'm an optimist. I tend to believe that things are, you know, almost anything's possible, maybe not at the same time, you know, but I tend to, I notice that I tend to view the world through an optimist orientation, like, yeah, you know, that can work. And even if that didn't work, let's try that. And so what I'm noticing, especially at this sort of wise age that I've achieved at this point, that it makes me really quite flexible, quite curious, willing to try something new. And I get feedback from clients as well as from my staff that they really appreciate that about me because it creates easier inclusion. People find me an easy to approach partner and I'm brave, but I don't te- I don't generally get rigid unless I'm scared or in my scarcity box, you know. So that's kind of where I was coming from when I, uh, when I landed on that one for myself. Yeah. And I think it's such a valuable leadership superpower because in this changing world, this changing environment, you got different people constantly coming in to your workspace and, and clients and different people that you're interacting with. And it's so important to be able to relate and adapt and to understand where other people are coming from. I love that superpower, not just because it's mine, but because I think it's so <laughs> valuable and so important. Our next question is a leadership quote, philosophy, or mantra, something that you live by. I had a hard time picking here because I have a few. One is my own, which is something I find myself saying all the time, which is it all made sense at the time. The other one that's really powerful in my world right now with my clients that I'm currently supporting is who you are is how you lead, which is from Dr. Brene Brown. And it just rings so true for me with, with people as they try to hone their craft and their practice of leadership is it really requires that we understand who we really are. And so those are my two favorites right now. Those are both wonderful. The who you are is how you lead. To me, that's really about, you know, I often say that personal development always must precede professional development. You have to become within before you can lead or excel in your profession. And so I love that one, but I want to take you back to your own because I really love it. And I want to make sure that our listeners clue in on it a little bit. It all made sense at the time. Great philosophy. But tell us a little bit about the origin of that. Well, I I think I don't even know where it came from. It may be that I got that, that I learned that expression from my father, who I mentioned actually in the foreword of Brave Space. My father was a recovering alcoholic. He got sober when I was six. And I grew up in the halls of AA and 
he's now passed. He died um, sort of young, sadly, but but he, I think, used that expression, which was in his context, it was one around you do the best you can and then you move forward. You know, today's a new day and today's the day you have. And so for me, I love that expression in the work that I do because clients often come to me with really messy, complex problems and they'll they'll look in the rearview mirror at the decisions they made and they'll sometimes feel, as we all will, you know, badly about, gosh, if only we hadn't made that move or it was a mistake to hire that leader. And I I often find that that expression, you know, it all made sense at the time, allows us to say, you know, we did the best we could at that time, knowing what we knew then. And now we know something different. And so it gives us this infinite possibility of saying, you know, gosh, it's we can make a different decision, you know, tomorrow. And we don't need to beat ourselves up for the decisions that we made, you know, yesterday, because we probably did the best we could. Yeah, I love that. And there's a reason why the windshield on a car is larger than the rear view. And that's because what's in front of you is so much more important than what's behind you. And not beating ourselves up about what we did in the past. Sure, we did in the past because of it made sense to us at the time. And that allows us to progress and to move forward. So I love that quote. Now, before I ask you the last question, I want to circle back. Lately, I've been reading David Baldacci. That's the author that has the multiple oh, yeah. series and every series has a different lead character. And I've, I've gone through all of them now. I'm just wrapping up the Maxwell and uh, Shaw series. So very good stuff. But nobody's here to listen to what Jake's reading. They want to hear from you. So tell us, final question, the book that you most often gift or recommend to others. Well, I used to most often find myself giving Wallace Stegner Angle of Repose. Have you read it? No, I haven't. Beautiful story of the American West. It's a Pulitzer Prize winner. Pulitzer Prize winner and just beautifully, it's one of those books that is just beautiful from start to finish. It's a true work of art. So that's one that I find I still do gift and I've gifted a lot. But I'm also gifting these days, I think it might be something to do with my stage. I've got a lot of you know, college and high school graduates. And I'm really enjoying Caroline Kennedy's poetry anthology. I was an English major in college and she wrote a lovely anthology of uh, women's poetry called She Walks in Beauty. And I'm finding myself giving that quite a bit to young grads, especially female grads, but not only because there's beautiful poetry by women for, for men as well. So I would say those are the two top. And of course, I give a lot of Brave Space copies away and I give Dare to Lead often to my client uh, groups, Brene's book, because they're, it's pretty applicable to the work we do. I love gifting both those books. Well, very cool. And this is a great transition into the very end of the podcast, which is take just a minute, share with us how we can pick up a copy of Brave Space, learn more about you and connect with you. Thank you so much for the chance to do that. So uh, my website is simply mocarrick.com. It's M-O-E, it's the funny first spelling. And you can find out a lot more about me and the business there. You can also reach the book site, which is bravespaceworkplace.com there. You can buy the book for both sites. It's available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and all the independent um, booksellers as well. Ingram is my distributor. And so they're well represented in the independent um, space. So lots of places to find me and you can find my Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook handles on both those sites. Well, very cool. And we're going to link all of that up on the show notes at this time. We got to let you go, but I want to thank you for coming on this week's episode. You've delivered so much value and it's great to talk to a leader with so much wisdom and experience and this great book that we got to pick up. Thank you for being this week's guest expert. Thank you so much, Jake. Really appreciate the chance. I look forward to talking more. Thank you. All right, my friends, and a big thank you to Mo Carrick for coming on the show and talking about this authentic workplace, really maximizing our potential, this brave space. And I love the name and the title and all the things that we jumped into today. Looking forward to diving even deeper into this great book, Brave Space, and all the things that are going on in her community. Of course, everything that we talked about on this episode of the podcast can be found at jakeacarlson.com slash ml130 episode 130. And until next week, I want to wish you the very best of days and even better life. And of course, remember, everything is figure outable. Stay awesome. (music) 
Thanks for listening to the Modern Leadership Podcast. You can find me on Facebook at Speaker Jake, on Twitter at Jake A. Carlson, and of course, the website, jakeacarlson.com. See you there. Thank you.